In this video, I'm going to show you around what became the ultimate super fortress. I'll mention how it differed from the B-29 that we all know, how it revolutionized in-air refueling, and what on earth these devices were on what could have been the ultimate ultimate super fortress. I'm Paul Stewart, and I make videos about planes. This includes reviews on board flights from around the world and guided tours around interesting aircraft in museums just like this one. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson for letting me film this aircraft. Let's start with some background. The B-29 was a highly successful heavy bomber, but the wartime urgency resulted in it being rushed, so Boeing was keen to address some of the problems, most significantly being the engine. It was to be upgraded with major WASP radials amongst other things that I'll get to soon, and be called the B-29D. There was a dramatic reduction in interest at the end of World War II, and the US government cancelled thousands of orders. Unofficially, it was thought that no one recognised the major upgrades with this aircraft, so it was re-designated the B-50, just for more attention. There were no prototypes as the engine and upgraded tail were tested on B-29s, so the first B-50A flew on the 25th of June 1947. From a distance, the fuselage looks the same, although there were many upgrades underneath. You'll notice that there's a flat section of glass in the nose, and that was to improve the accuracy of the bomb sight. The rounded glass on older aircraft created distortions in their view, and later ones, such as the B-36, had similar flat sections of the nose, but they eventually used periscopic-like bomb sights that stuck down through a hole in the fuselage. The B-50D model also reduced the complex seven-piece nose cone from earlier models to the single one that you see here. Here's the B-29, and then the B-50D to compare once again. Another major upgrade was, and you can only see this from above, is the in-flight refueling capability. Here's a photo of the receptacle above the fuselage. This meant that it could now reach the Soviet Union. It could also receive fuel via a looped hose, and I'll show you that later. While there is a lot of glass, well, before it was removed from this example, there's also a lot of frames that would obstruct the gunner's view, so the visibility really wasn't as good as you'd expect. Later, I'll show you how they were going to get around this. Now, one of the major reasons to upgrade the B-29 was the engine. Its right R3350 duplex cyclone was notorious for overheating, so it was replaced by a more powerful, four-row 28-cylinder Pratt & Whitney R4360 WASP major radial engine producing 3,500 horsepower each. The capacity was 4,300 cubic inches, in contrast with around 300 cubic inches in a Ford Mustang V8 for comparison's sake. The extra power increased the top speed to 394 miles per hour at 30,000 feet. This same engine was used on the B-36, albeit in a pusher configuration, which led to other temperature problems, as the carburetor was positioned at the rear and would usually have been heated by the engine exhaust, but now it was at the front and it was prone to icing up. Check out my B-36 video for more on that. Back to the B-50, and the intake for the oil cooling was much lower than the previous engine, thus improving the overall temperature control. The propellers themselves were larger and also geared down from the engine to avoid the tips breaking the speed of sound. They could also reverse the flow of air and slow the aircraft on landing. The inner aspect was also designed to direct air into the engine nacelle to help with the cooling. It's worth noting that the 28 cylinders are positioned in four rows of seven, and they were in a slight offset from the previous cylinder, forming a semi-helical setup, allowing air to pass through to the next one. Hence it was nicknamed the Corn Cob. Over 18,000 of these engines were built from 1944 to 1955. The in-air refueling versions, such as this one, the KB-50J, replaced two wing-mounted extra fuel tanks with General Electric J-47 turbojets, producing 5,200 pounds of thrust each. It was the first axial flow turbojet used in commercial use in the USA, although it was used by many military aircraft, including four of them on the B-36, six of them on the B-47, and a single one of them used in the F-86 Sabre. These increased the top speed so that it could speed up and dock with the much faster jets, as a major problem with these prop aircraft was that they could barely fly as fast as the jet stalling speed. 
thus making the transfer of fuel a very difficult and dangerous process. But the addition of the turbojets meant that a secondary fuel system had to be installed because it would use a different fuel to the radial piston engines. Of interest, the B-36, with both of these same turbojets and piston engines, was designed to run on the single type of fuel, which reduced complexity. Here's a weather reconnaissance WB-50, and you'll notice that there's no turbojets on those. Moving further out on the wing are one of three drogue hose pods, with the other being in the tail and then another on the other wing. Here's one in action, and positioning these further out on the wings helped move the receiving aircraft away from much of the prop wash you'd have to deal with if directly behind. In fact, you'll notice that the tail hose was angled down so that the thirsty plane could sit underneath the turbulent air. Additional large fuel tanks were stored inside the bomb bay, while the regular B-50 could have auxiliary fuel tanks underneath the wings out here, as you can see with this example. Another upgrade from the B-29 was a reinforced wing which was required due to the larger engine and props, the increased fuel load and the landing gear. They used a new type of aluminium known as 75S, and this was stronger and lighter so the new wing weighed actually 600 pounds less. They also installed larger flaps to help take off with the extra weight. Moving to the tail and what's immediately obvious is the enlarged vertical tail and rudder. In fact, it was 5 feet taller. Hydraulic boosting of the rudder was added to help reduce the pilot's workload as well. The bigger tail helped maintain your control in the instance of an engine failure. The prop engines were larger, and the added jets were all great when they worked, but if failed, they would generate a whole lot of drag on one side of the aircraft, hence the need for the bigger tail to manage this. But it would have been an issue with hangars which were much smaller back then, so Boeing installed the ability for it to fold sideways, just like a B-52. You can see the line on this example where the aft section would fold laterally, as you can see in this photo. This object down here was another drogue hose pod. As I mentioned earlier, the aircraft approaching this would be exposed to the prop wash and it was a difficult and dangerous process. Initially, they would have used a loop hose refueling system where the receiving aircraft would catch a small line from the tanker and then haul over a fuel line. This was obviously complex and time consuming and a Boeing designed flying boom method was later introduced. Here the pilots could just hold the aircraft stable and the boom operator would direct it into the receptacle. This was also much easier than having to attach to a drogue hose that you can see here which was free to fly around in the wind. Another thing to mention was the armament. The regular B-50 had a manned tail turret as you can see here and there was a total of 13 50 cal M2 Browning machine guns located here and in four remote control turrets. Here's a photo of where you can see the turret positions and some of the viewpoints where the operators would be positioned. Obviously they weren't required on this refueling version and thus removed. Looking down here and we have the main landing gear. It was strengthened from the B-29s to facilitate the takeoff weight increase from around 133,000 pounds up to 173,000 pounds and that would increase further with later models. It would retract into the engine nacelle leaving the lower part of the fuselage free for the bomb load. This was in contrast with the later B-47 Stratojet and the B-52 for that matter which both had much thinner wings and smaller engine nacelles, so the landing gear was moved to the fuselage, but fore and aft of the bomb bay and in a bicycle layout. Check out my B-47 tour video for more discussion about that. Unlike the earlier B-17 that would have part of the wheel still visible when retracted, and that was to provide cushioning during a gear up landing, this would fully retract, thus reducing drag and improving range. And moving forward to the nose wheel, which was upgraded to be steerable from the cockpit. The B-29 simply had what was called a castering nose wheel, and while this was simpler and lighter, the crew could only turn with differential throttle and braking. This made takeoff challenging, as the throttle response wouldn't be immediate, and they would need to be going fast enough before the rudder could be used to steer. The B-50 crew could simply adjust the nose wheel to steer. Here's a B-29 nose wheel for comparison's sake, and you can see that it appears far less complex. And back to the B-50 once again. 
Now this disassembled aircraft at the Plane of Fame Museum in California is special because it's actually Lucky Lady 2, which was the first plane to fly around the world non-stop. It was refueled four times over the Azores, Saudi Arabia, Philippines and then Hawaii by KB-29 tankers. It took 94 hours and one minute landing on March 2, 1949. Sadly, this aircraft was disassembled after an accident, and here's what's left of it. And highlighting the rapid advances in aviation, just seven years later, the B-52 would also fly around the world non-stop, but in less than half of the time. It's also worth mentioning that this was the only B-50A left anywhere in the world, and I'm sure they'd love donations to help restore it for display. There was a reconnaissance RB-50 fitted with high-altitude photography equipment, and some were fitted with systems to detect Soviet defensive equipment such as radars. These would run ferret missions where they would provoke a Soviet response and then measure their radar and listen to their radio messages to learn more about how the Soviets would respond. The B-50 could fly higher than any Soviet World War II fighter, but the arrival of the jet-powered MiG-15 changed that dramatically, reducing the safety of these flights until the B-47 arrived. In fact, it was one of these that was the only B-50 variant to be lost in combat. In 1953, an RB-50G was shot down near Vladivostok by two MiG-17s. Sadly, only the co-pilot survived. A weather reconnaissance version called the WB-50 replaced the older WB-29s. It could fly higher, faster and longer than its predecessor and was fitted with Doppler radar and other equipment and extra fuel tanks. It was used to fly classified missions to obtain atmospheric samples to detect if the Soviets were detonating nuclear weapons in the early 1950s. This was also used to monitor the weather around Cuba to help plan photo reconnaissance flights during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was eventually replaced in this role by the WB-47. The EB-50B was modified to test the bicycle undercarriage later used on the B-47 and B-52, and was later used to test a Caterpillar track landing gear. This had the benefit of spreading the weight over a larger area, which was useful on grass or if the plane was just incredibly heavy, as we saw with the B-36. But the belts just couldn't operate fast enough for landing and takeoff, so the idea was scrapped. Of interest, a track system was considered on the B-36 as well, but didn't make it into production. It could carry 20,000 pounds of bombs internally and 8,000 pounds on external hardpoints, although there were modifications made for the 40,000 pound T-12 clad maker bomb. Now I found conflicting information if it was installed in a B-29 or this, but either way, here's a photo. The bomb bay was also regularly modified to fit different atomic bombs as they went into production, and you can see it sitting over a bomb loading pit here. The B-50 was also used to test drop multiple atomic bombs over the Nevada test site in the late 1940s and early 1950s. This view of the bomb detonating from this altitude really is awe-inspiring and terrifying at the same time. You can see mention of test atomic group painted on the side of the fuselage of this aircraft here. In addition to dropping the bombs, it also flew through the atomic cloud and with equipment attached to the fuselage, they would measure the fallout. These would follow the radioactive material for hours after the detonation, measuring the intensity and spread. After that, they would wash any radiation particles off the aircraft, as you can see here with this B-29. It was also used as a mothership for the Bell X-1 high-speed research plane. It was the first piloted aircraft to exceed the speed of sound in level flight, with famed test pilot Chuck Yeager on board and the first of the X-planes, which were a series of experimental aircraft flown by the USA to explore new technology. It also carried the Bell Jam 63 Rascal, which was the USAF's first standoff air-to-ground nuclear missile. It was cancelled, but initially designed to be launched from the B-50, amongst other aircraft, including the B-47, as you can see here. This refueling KB-50 was retired in 1965 after corrosion was discovered as contributing to a crash in Thailand in 1964. They were all replaced by the jet-powered KC-135. 
Now, unfortunately, I couldn't film inside this aircraft, although the interior was much the same as that seen inside the B-29, and I'll link to my video crawling around that aircraft, also here at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, in the video description below. But back to the B-50, and the number of crew would depend on the configuration, but they all had at least two pilots, a navigator and a flight engineer. A bombardier radio ECM operator was added to the regular version in addition to multiple guys to operate the turrets. The refueling versions would have two refueling operators, and the weather and reconnaissance versions also had extra crew to operate their various systems. Now it's worth mentioning what would have been the ultimate ultimate superfortress, but sadly never made it further than a mock-up as you can see here. It's the B-54. The engine was upgraded to R4360 variable discharge turbines, the fuselage was lengthened by over 10 feet to make the atomic bombs fit in easier, and the wingspan was extended by 20 feet. The wing was so wide now, in fact, that they had to install outrigger wheels in the first and fourth engine nacelle. Much more fuel would be carried, thus creating a longer range. You can certainly make out that it's related to the B-50, but it's worth mentioning some of the additions that you can see in the photos. You may recall that the Super Fortress's front cone has a lot of glass, but also a lot of frames which would obstruct the gunner's view, so this hemispheric sight was installed. They could sit comfortably still and look into this eyepiece and get an unimpeded view from the outside. There was one position both at the front and at the tail of the aircraft. The gunner's hand grip would move both the gun and the scanning prisms inside the sight's head so the bullets would fire directly to where the gunner was looking. These would work in conjunction with the radar system in the dome below. Here's a B-52D and you can see a similar sight, although it's far less obvious. In 1948, the USAF did place orders for this aircraft, although it was eventually cancelled as it became evident that newer jet-powered bombers were going to be vastly superior. It seems that the Strategic Air Command boss, Curtis LeMay, wasn't a fan and he preferred the B-36. Now I know that this is a B-29 and not the 50, but it's a fascinating photo of the two together and highlights just how massive the B-36 is. The last B-50 was delivered in March 1953 and a total of 371 were made. The reality was that it was only ever a stopgap before the next generation of jets arrived and went on to dominate military aviation. While the B-50D was removed from bomber service in 1955, Reconnaissance versions continued on until the arrival of the B-47. Weather recon and refueling 50s continued into the 1960s and replaced by the WB-47 and KC-135 respectively. The final flight was in 1967, and this is the very same aircraft now retired at the USAF Museum in Dayton, Ohio. The Superfortress really was an incredible aircraft, with the B-29 being designed during the worst of World War II and first flew in 1942. Then later versions went on to operate during the Korean and Vietnam Wars, as well as the Cold War. It really was a versatile and fascinating design and a credit to the engineers who designed it and the brave men who flew in it. We often get caught up with the fascinating engineering that goes into these birds and forget the incredible sacrifice made by the thousands of airmen lost during conflicts throughout the world on board these. If you enjoyed the video, then please give it a thumbs up and comment below with your thoughts about this fascinating aircraft. Check out my guided tour video around the B-29, B-36 and B-47 bombers that I've mentioned earlier and many others on my channel. Thanks for watching.